Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back. Welcome for the first time to Libraries in Response. This is session 88 in our series. Uh, began, it'll be four years next month when the pandemic was declared. Today, we're focusing on cybersecurity and libraries uh, in the age of AI. Uh, it, it's a vast subject, and of course, we won't cover all of it, but we'll get to some interesting aspects of it through the good graces of Justin and Nathaniel, who've offered to share their time and experience with us today. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, an open consortium of Libraries doing interesting things with technology, uh, communications technology, extending access to library Wi-Fi well beyond the walls is a project we've been working on for a long time and in partnership with the International Federation of Libraries, Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, based in The Hague, uh, a global association of national libraries and national library associations. Uh, but not only, anybody can join IFLA, and they've been a great partner in uh, expanding public access and our partner in the series hosting and recording these sessions. Uh, with us at the helm is Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy at IFLA and uh, a longtime associate. We have some sponsorship this year from uh, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Thank you very much, IMLS. Uh, we started in response to the COVID pandemic when it blew up in March, well, when the pandemic was formally declared and we were all closed. What's going on? What is this? How serious? And so uh, it was more libraries in reaction in the beginning, but then as solutions started to emerge, then, you know, it kind of transformed into responses and then around October or maybe September of 2020, we shifted over to libraries in recovery. Well, it seemed a little premature because uh, the pandemic wasn't through with us, as it's still not through with us, uh, though it has modified or moderated its uh, lethality, its infectiousness has not. It's still very infectious and morphing and uh, transmuting constantly. So it's kind of one mutation away from being a, you know, a serious threat again. And if it's not the COVID virus, then it could be another one. But we have a new experience here with uh, a global health uh, phenomena. I mean, it hits so fast. Recall, it's hard to remember. Uh, that was four years ago, but it hit everywhere. And all of civilization, all humanity, suddenly turned on a dime in response to this thing. Nothing has ever caused so much change so quickly. I don't know. Uh, I mean, world wars take longer than that to involve everybody. But COVID really got our attention. And I, I, personally, it feels like to me that we're still in some state of shock to that, to that massive hit at, at our normality. And uh, we started coming up with new terms like new normal. Well, it seems like there's no normal is the new normal. Uh, but then it was just a cascade of these crises that coming in. There was the, there was the COVID and then we had, uh, of course, climate is always with us and more intense. We have AI we're going to talk about today, war, uh, social, economic, uh, political crises. So it's just nonstop. And so this is our kind of favorite summation of all of that together. Uh, and the poor world is longing for the good old days when all I had to worry about was nuclear annihilation, which if you're following the news, it's not, has not gone away. Uh, apparently there are nuclear weapons in orbit that would create serious disruption uh, to the communications infrastructure of the world if they were detonated. So we continue to live on the edge, and I think it's taking its toll on, on our psyche and probably manifesting in, in your, all your librarians, libraries. So we have to deal with things one at a time. We can't deal with everything all of the time. Uh, so one thing one at a time as we go through it. And so here we are with cybersecurity. So the, the world of the Internet has grown 
less stable, less reliable, and the quality has uh, continued to decline, uh, much to the chagrin of most of us, many of us. And we've been working on, you know, trying to bring people into the internet, but, you know, is how safe is that for a new user? You know, I think a lot of us have been using the internet for years are still susceptible to, uh, phishing and and hacking and uh, other kinds of nefarious or just accidental uh, phenomena that can really disrupt our our use of this thing. So we're going to hear what uh, strategies and techniques that are being used at the Columbus Library and the Slow Center Regional Library in Pennsylvania. And I want to welcome Justin and Nathaniel. We're going to start with uh, Nathaniel, who is back with us. Uh, Nathaniel, I think, may have been our first guest in March of 2020 when uh, they figured out ways to extend the, the Internet uh, to the community, even as the building was closed. And so welcome back, Nathaniel. <laughs> We worked on projects you, together. Great to see you. Yeah. So, tell us, tell us what what you're doing to protect us all, or at least the, <laughs> the people in your circle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, you know what I'm I'm hoping to talk about today is something that's just been weighing on my mind um, from an IT professional perspective, but really also just a library perspective in general. Because, as Don touched on, uh, we're talking about um, you know sort of a core but emerging information literacy here that uh, many of us are really not very well prepared for. Uh, let me get my slides going here and then I will tell you more. Um, While you're doing that, Daniel, I was just, Nathaniel, I was just reminded of that sign you put up. I think you might've been one of the first libraries in the country to post a sign in the parking lot, Wi-Fi here, and with the password, I think you published the password on the sidewalk, or maybe you just ran it open, I don't remember. But that was the beginning of, you know, uh, libraries everywhere opening out beyond the walls, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, so. Yeah, that was a, go. a crazy time. But uh, yeah, we have a photo of that sign up uh, in our, our new IT offices in the library here. And it's, it's a nice reminder every time when I come in to see that. And remember the stress we all felt in those days, but also the opportunity we had to, to try to do something helpful. So that was good. Absolutely. Um, can you see my slides all right, Don? Yep. Looks good. Okay. Good. All right. So, uh, and what I'm focusing on today is primarily sort of, you know, in, in the IT world or the security world, you call the social engineering side uh, of, of security threats, which is really often the easiest target is to go after the people. Um, if you want to know the password to something or something, rather than trying to hack your way into a computer like they do in the movies, it's a lot easier to get somebody to tell you what the password is. So um, in particular, uh, I'm talking about scams. Um, and I think I'd like to start at least uh, sort of passively here by asking any of our participants um, to go ahead and use the chat feature as long as they have that capability. Um, and just tell if, if you yourself has fall, have fallen prey to an internet or phone scam or someone close to you has, uh, just give a brief recap. Uh, I think it's always illuminating to show just how widespread this this problem has become. So if you have something that you can share, I'd love to see that in the chat. Um, you may not have a chance to review that till later, but I think that might be fun to try. So let me know. Um, in particular, um, you know, we can look at the data. Um, there's uh, a lot of estimates out there in terms of how large of a problem this is. <clears throat> And uh, I saw some FTC estimates that, uh, you know, in 2022, they saw a 30% rise in reported scams, uh, costing uh, $8.8 .8 billion. I've seen estimates that reported scams constitute 3 to 15% of all the ones activity that are going out there. 
um, doing some very dirty maths. That means that we're talking about an industry that's in the same class globally as the airline industry. Um, it's a gigantic problem and it's, it's only growing. Uh, just last week, in fact, I, I mentioned this as we were getting started this morning, um, Corey Doctorow, one of my favorite uh, tech follows uh, on all, all things technology, uh, fell for a scam himself. Um, and he uh, uh, recaps that uh, in the article I mentioned here. I'll make sure I show that slide again that gets you access to these slides if you want to pull those URLs for yourself. Um, but he, he goes into good detail and is very candid with his own uh, failings when uh, one of the premier technologists in our world today uh, fell, fell for a phone scam. Um, he also has some good insights on the AI piece, which is what we are focusing on a bit today. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this particular uh, case, it's a little bit older now, um, but still sort of an emerging concept. Um, and I encourage you to listen to this NPR um, story if you have a chance. Um, it goes into some detail about a person that thought that they were called by law enforcement, um, saw a phone number on their, their caller ID, and uh, you know was threatened uh, that uh, if she didn't straighten some things out, she was going to you know be in trouble with the law. Um, and you know she went so far as like, well, I'm a cautious person. Do I trust this phone number? So she looked up the uh, government agency, and the number in her caller ID matched. So that gave her some some uh, confidence that this was good. And um, you know she proceeded and got very close to uh, transferring a lot of money to make this problem go away uh, before she finally realized that maybe something wasn't quite right. Um, you know, that's just sort of traditional techniques, a little bit more sophisticated maybe at this point because, um, you know, the, the caller ID spoofing and things like that are a little more involved. But it's uh, illustrative to me, I think, that, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we've been raised, even as information professionals, to be suspicious of aren't quite enough. Um, and, and that, you know, it's kind of a moving target in terms of there's not one thing you have to be on the lookout for um, when these, these scams come to your, to your awareness or not, as the case may be. Um, so, yeah, I, I mentioned here that, you know, AI is just getting started. Um, when I, you know, when chat GPT came out, I immediately started thinking, oh, boy, I think these scams are going to get more interesting. Um, and I think... Uh, you know, there's a lot of potential for artificial intelligence to make these problems for us, uh, our libraries and our patrons worse. Um, the one that Cory Doctorow talks about that I think his, his perspective on AI I found, find very interesting and not um, quite as rah-rah as a lot, of, a lot of perspectives out there. As he points out that really one of the, the worst impacts that he believes AI, at least in the short term, is going to have on this kind of thing is that companies are going to be outsourcing more and more of their, their vetting of you know, security practices to AI, to chatbots and things like that. And that you know, their, their particular failings will only exacerbate some of these problems because the, the mechanisms that they're putting in place to verify an identity or um, prove something is real um, to somebody um, is going to be outsourced to a machine that may or may not have the nuance um, to actually um, you know, verify as securely as a human might. Um, but of course, also AI is available to the scammers themselves. So uh, you know, there's, there's definitely documentation of this happening already where, um, you know, it's already, you know, well, we've already heard that that a lot of uh, the internet scams and things that are out there now, you know, employ people at, at very poor uh, wage levels, sometimes um, more along the lines of indentured servitude or, or even slavery in terms of the people that are making these calls are, are devalued as humans um, and often even sometimes coerced to participate. Um, well, now, you know, in addition to that, 
uh, you know, an AI chatbot can be used to initiate SMS scams and, and, and start the scamming going without any human involvement, which dramatically decreases the overhead and increases the, the cost benefit analysis for someone that wants to scam. Um, so I think that's a real concern um, and one that we're already seeing in, in some of the emerging scams that I've heard about. Um, I was pleased, I think it was just last week as well, that it was announced uh, it was the federal uh, legislature, well, excuse me, legislature passed a law um, saying that they, uh, they, it's no longer, you know, it's not legal to uh, produce uh, a deep fake uh, voice, you know, so um, one of the scams that's out there uh, right now is, you know, the one where the grandparent gets a call from purportedly or a text or an email purportedly from their, their grandchild that's being held hostage or that sort of situation. Um, you know, as, as voices are more and more easily duplicated um, and natural speech patterns harder and harder to discern um, from, from fake ones, uh, you know, that problem also gets more sophisticated. And also just general scam sophistication, you know, uh, often if they can make uh, a crisis appear concerning coming from multiple different in, uh, information sources and things like that, I think uh, there's greater potential for people's guard to be dropped. Um, I do think AI, you know, has a role to play, um, you know, uh, I, uh, Cybersecurity is often an arms race of one kind or another where technology evolves um, and, and one side uh, gets gets a leg up for a brief time before you know the other side uses similar technologies to thwart the new the new trick. And we're seeing that. Um, you know, but I think there are certainly tools out there that we can expect to see and use and emerge that help us identify an email as potentially fraudulent. And certainly Google has some tools with their G, you know, ever popular Gmail service um, that do that today. And I think we'll see those to continue to evolve and libraries along with everyone else will probably have to look at, at you know, procuring those tools to help manage uh, their information flows and, and alert their staff to problems. Um, Similarly, uh, this is something that's new. I was just reading about in Australia, uh, some researchers that have developed um, a chat bot to waste the time of scam call centers by pretending to be victims and um, wasting their time in, at an industrial scale, which, you know, it's always heartwarming to see. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd, I guess, but I enjoy following um, the different YouTube channels that are out there that show humans doing this and, and exposing how the scammers are doing what they do um, or, or revealing, you know, these giant call centers um, in foreign lands that are, um, you know, targeting helpless folks. Um, so it, it's, it's pleasing, but I think, you know, it's never been at the scale where it really tips the scales in terms of cost benefit, but perhaps um, at an industrial scale like this, it's something that we could look to see, um, uh, you know, an impact made. So that might be nice. I think really uh, the, the training piece is kind of a key one in my mind, because I think, you know, uh, certainly library staff have to be trained on these things and uh, identifying them. I'll talk a little bit more about what that might look like. Um, but, uh, you know, with AI involved, you can develop um, scenarios and things for your staff to go through, or even your patrons, perhaps, um, that help you, um, you know, stay stay abreast of, of how insidious some of these scams and things can be. Um, and I sort of tongue-in-cheek say a culture of mistrust is a positive here. Um, I think, obviously, we've seen with, um, you know, misinformation and uh, the use of deep fakes and the growing distrust in communications in general, um, you know, we may see a broader adoption of types of communication that really, you know, verify identity so that, you know, um, I use an app called Signal um, in, in place of SMS or text messaging. 
that, you know, theoretically uh, should prevent you from uh, getting a text from someone claiming to be a loved one or someone you know and trust, but being somebody else. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that, that, you know, those tools have been around a long time. We've just been waiting for critical mass and adoption to make them commonplace. And I think we're probably going to be seeing that happen in the short term. Um, really, to me, I think what we need to do, though, is, is look inward. Um, uh, these scams really um, prey on us as, as we are as individuals. Um, and so I think uh, better than any particular, oh, well, the scammers are doing this now, so we have to look out for that. And tomorrow it's a new thing. And that's part of it. But I, I think a lot of it is also just being aware of our own vulnerabilities um, as, as humans. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what are scammers looking for? They're looking to uh, leverage um, expertise anxiety. Oh, I don't understand my computer. You can help me. Please, please provide me with tech support. Um, loneliness with the, the romance scams that are out there. Uh, I've seen some really horrible things in my own community. Um, marriages torn apart and things like that. But some of those, um, those scams, obviously fear, greed, secret information, Comparing goodness, those kinds of things that we, that we are as people can be preyed upon. So just being aware of that um, as we go through our lives is probably something that, that we need to call attention to. Um, you know, there are myriad communication channels these days. Um, all of them are probably susceptible at some point. Um, so we see you know, all kinds of things coming at us from different ways and just being aware of what those channels are and how we uh, use them and, and, and verify trust, I think is key. Um, and then, you know, sort of the uh, the tone of a, a conversation or piece, I think is something to be pay attention to as well. Um, you know, always be suspicious of this immediate urgency that you're feeling that you had no idea was urgent before the phone call took place. Um, it's okay to take a breath and think about it, verify, look things up, do your own you know, way to that information. Um, all similarly with the need for any kind of secrecy, not, not sharing, not involving others. Um, my own stepfather fell prey to a phone scam where he was buying gift cards at Walmart. Um, and thankfully my mother detected something was wrong because he was told not to let anyone know he was doing this. And so she was like, hey, can you come take a look at this? And, and I was able to stop it before he lost too much money. And he only lost about $800. Um, that highlights obviously the unusual ways to pay um, with the gift cards and things like that, a very popular way as well as cryptocurrency. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what I, you know, talk about like being aware of how we use our digital tools, um, being very confident and okay, if I'm doing banking online, I use this URL, I use this path, I use this way of, of verifying that my bank is communicating with me. Um, AI will make this harder for sure, but I think being very aware of the worn path and not taking uh, just because you feel this sudden sense of urgency taking a, a tangential path that's not well-worn and it's a good practice to develop. I think this is a lot more uh, what uh, Justin's going to be talking about, but um, you know, from an IT professional perspective, uh, we really need uh, emphasis on, on good digital practices, strong passwords, multi-factor um, data stewardship, um, penetration testing, spam testing, and of course, training for staff and patrons. I think, I think we needed to come from a, a strong buy-in at the administrative level, but we also needed to come from our staff understanding, recognizing, and developing their own skills. Uh, lots more I could talk about on this topic, but uh, I had limited time. Uh, I'd, I'd love to entertain any questions if you have it. Uh, that short URL should get you to these slides uh, or shoot me an email and be happy to talk to you further.
That's great, Nathaniel. Uh, so you've covered a lot of things to be aware of, and, and you've sort of emphasized awareness as the key kind of defense. But are there some kind of basic uh, steps that people can take? I mean, uh, emails are probably the most prominent way. I mean, there are phone calls, but emails are a really prominent way for people to be misled. Uh, is there is there a, a way to uh, you know is there a standard way to kind of check on things? Like I will I will check the actual email address from something and it'll it'll often it'll look really strange like oh there's another one uh but did you recommend sort of not dealing with any so solicitations directly but say okay if there's a problem i'll go directly to the site i'll go to the directly to my bank or directly to my vendor through their website and then i will investigate this from that standpoint rather than responding to anybody yeah. that might be reaching out. I glossed over that section a bit because I didn't want to uh, go over time. But yes, I, I generally recommend that that's kind of going back to knowing your path is um, don't don't reply to the email. Certainly, I mean, everybody's heard don't click the link in the email if you have any reasons to suspect. And, and the emails are getting more and more realistic looking. So I, that's, that's absolutely still true. Um, I do think that a literacy that we should be teaching everybody, uh, staff and patrons, when we have the opportunity, is how to read and understand what a URL is. Um, that's getting harder and harder these days because uh, browsers are thinking that the URL is less and less important. <laughs> um, someone asked about Signal. Um, sure, uh, I can ask an answer about that too. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, Generally, I think a lot of those kinds of things are good. Um, they are constantly evolving. You know, it's that arms race thing again. So um, it, it's difficult to say this is the one thing you can do to be safe. But going back to that general principle of, well, if I do business with this company, I do it this way. I walk across the street to the, the bank teller or I, I log into the app on my smartphone. Um, and you're you're going to be much safer taking that pathway to seek the information um, from a trusted, a place of trust rather than, than assuming a communication coming your way is trustworthy for sure. Um, as far as signal goes, uh, you know, there are other end-to-end -end encryption tools out there. Um, you know, WhatsApp is very popular. Um, Apple iMessage itself offers that um, natively. Uh, what signal does is uh, in, in the IT world, you know, there, there's, long been thought of uh, this sort of concept of trust and verifiable trust. Um, if, if you're familiar with the concept of certificates, um, with Signal, uh, your personal phone and phone number um, provides enough data to the app Signal to create a very unique certificate that identifies that combination as you. Um, and it becomes very, very difficult um, for a uh, you know, malicious party to then impersonate you on that channel. I mean, certainly the name can say Nathaniel or something like that, but Signal is set up in such a way that it would tell you, hey, there's something wrong with this. You know, this, this message is not signed. Um, there are ways that email can sort of adopt this. Um, it, it gets a little tricky because not everybody does adopt it. But that's certainly possible. Um, and if you're an IT type person, something to look at impl implementing. Um, or if you're an administrative person, asking your IT folks about. Um, but as we're typically dealing with the general public, I don't think you can ever expect that all of your email communications are going to be signed in that way. Let's see, uh, question good. here. What? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. One, one quick question, and, and then we can uh, go to Justin and kind of have an open Q&A at the end. But the challenge of uh, making patrons aware of these issues must be as big as any challenge. I mean, 
how do you do that? How do you draw people in to be interested in something that they're not interested in automatically, but maybe only after the fact? What's what's your strategy for, you know, uh, education and awareness? Yeah, that, that's a really tricky one, and it's one that we've been spending a lot of time on here lately. Um, uh, in our library, we've uh, started opening an IT service desk, um, and we've been promoting it pretty heavily, and it's getting pretty popular. So people can come in. We have scheduled office hours. They often come in for help setting up their iPad and that sort of thing. But I see that as a captive audience. So our, our service desk has all kinds of literature. I've partnered with our local sheriff who's had access to all kinds of cool pamphlets and brochures that cover all the different kinds of scams and all kinds of things that that can can um, go wrong in today's digital world. And uh, yeah, just having that literature there, uh, I feel like we've probably seen the most interest generated by people just sort of stopping in for one reason and then realizing, oh, there are these other things <laughs> that are happening um, that I should probably be aware of. Uh, we've tried teaching classes. Uh, attendance is never very good. Um, I think, again, it goes back to staff training and, and staff buy into this as sort of a core mission of the library. Um, you know, I, that's one thing that we're working on a lot is just training our own staff and inviting them to introduce the concept and and you know when we're when you know our adult services team is helping someone at a computer or um you know, somebody's checking out and they ask a question having an opportunity to say oh yeah you know that's you know signal might be a good way for you to start sending text messages or whatever it is um you know just building comfort among our staff but i have no firm answer for sure to that and it's an ongoing question you do do you do any of these patron trainings online or are they all in person? Uh, we've, we did a good bit of that kind of thing during the pandemic um, and then saw a lot of uh, attendance drop off. Um, I know, Don, I've talked to you about the idea of some sort of newsletter or you know, weekly tip. Um, that's something that we're currently developing. I think that's, that's potentially a way to get, get the word out more. Right. Maybe a social media account uh, where you're just sort of Slagging things of interest. I've been collecting articles on this topic for some time, so you know, we have a lot of backlog we can share out with folks. So that is definitely right, something we're right. looking at as well. Newsletter is a is a good idea. It's a lot of work, but it's something that then can be people can just check it real quick anytime and find something that's interest. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's shift over to Justin Bombico. Welcome, Justin. And uh, uh, Justin's going to take us a little more into the back end of library systems and how they're secured. So Justin, you're up. All right. Hopefully you can see, see my screen here. Um, Very good. Thanks, Don, for uh, the intro and thanks, Nathaniel. Um, for starting us out on uh, scams. I was jotting some notes down as you were going along and just uh, to transition us here. Um, I think the uh, majority of uh, scams and um, events, cyber events that that typically happen all start from uh, phishing attacks. So certainly important to be aware of and recognize um, those types of scams and, and to how to prevent them. Um, back to Don's first question. We're seeing those every day. I'm seeing, we're seeing them at work. Obviously we're talking about them, uh, why we're here today. Uh, we're seeing them in our personal lives and with our families and they're just all over the place. Uh, the deep fake stuff is, is definitely concerning, uh, and scary, but in general, even regular phishing scams are getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, an example, just to uh, keep that conversation going uh, for a second is, uh, we saw one just last week that was a, uh, there's a CEO to CFO scam. Um, and on the, the unique thing about this one that I hadn't seen, which was kind of simple in nature, but just gets on the more sophisticated topic, is there was a whole backstory in the email dialogue where uh, it was all, um, the real email addresses were in the email body. Of course, the scam email did not come from the real email address um, of our CEO, but there was a whole backstory um, uh, mocking up those email addresses 
uh, with a fake vendor um, asking for a payment and it went to our CFO. So fairly believable, um, especially if you're reading back through the body of the email and seeing that. So um, talking about the greater sophistication there, uh, one thing we uh, always tell people just simply press pause when you get those, you know, they're always trying to create a sense of urgency. So press pause before you go and make a knee jerk reaction. Think through that, um, you know, for better or for worse, I hope everyone is in a trusted environment where you can be supported if you're not um, be taking that immediate action, because uh, if you are feeling that sense of urgency, um, which kind of leads us into um, a little bit what I'll talk about, uh, Nathaniel hit on uh, buy-in and cyber hygiene. So that's kind of where I'm going to start. Um, uh, once again, I'm Justin Bumbico. I work as the IT director at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. I have been here for roughly 10 years, um, and in my background, I've always, I've had a couple of prior roles before this, um, but always in um, IT uh, infrastructure and specifically operations support. Uh, so this, this kind of hits on the buy-in a little bit, but I'm going to talk a little bit about a governance uh, risk and compliance uh, framework to start with, and then I'll go a little bit deeper into administrative controls and uh, technical controls. Um, in reality, a, a GRC or governance risk and compliance framework is about strategy, policy, and measurement. Um, at a high level, it's really just a practice and a tool uh, to help measure and priority, prioritize cybersecurity activities. Um, governance component is about your strategy and how you are monitoring and managing those activities. The risk component is about prioritizing, assessing, and taking actions um, based on factors and your organizational risk tolerance. Um, general risk can be challenging to navigate in the realm of cybersecurity as there are just tons of options that are available out there and, and vendors. Um, so it can quickly become overwhelming. Um, and then the last piece is about uh, compliance and making sure that you're adhering to your um, regulations and the practices that um, you are uh, uh, promising to follow. Um, back to the buy-in piece, I share this slide really because I wanted to hit on awareness and support. So looking at um, best practices uh, from the lens of governance, risk, and compliance, it's not just about an IT perspective, it's about aligning the technology strategy with the goals of the organization um, and helping to get everybody on the same page. So with that, um, talk a little bit about um, administrative controls. And when I say administrative controls there, I refer to them as procedures or guidelines, not more like less like hard technical controls, um, but more procedures or guidelines, standards that indicate how to execute on processes, um, a little different than technical controls. So I just wanted to cover some of the things that we do um, in this space. So uh, first one, audit committee. We have an audit committee that is um, meets quarterly. It's comprised of partially um, some of our board of trustee members, as well as our executive leadership team and um, as well as some other key positions across the organization, like our risk and compliance manager. And then um, more recently, over the last several years, IT has been added to those conversations um, on, a, uh, on a regular basis to, to talk um, and speak to what we've been doing in those meetings. So just having a seat at that table, um, being able to share our challenges, what we're working on and getting feedback um, through that group has been uh, helpful for us um, to get that support uh, to implement some of the changes and practices that we've uh, been doing. Second one here, uh, periodic assessments. Um, back when I started at CML, we actually had a full organizational risk assessment. So I started with the IT components that were part of that. Um, and nobody wakes up uh, or gets a call every day and says, oh man, I really wish I would have to go through an audit or an assessment. But in reality, there is definitely some positive that you can find um, through those processes, um, through those assessments um, from the lens of an external party, um, maybe guiding and directing where, where you could uh, have an opportunity to improve. Um, so much so that a couple of years after that organizational assessment that wasn't necessarily IT related, we um, actually partnered with a uh, hired a company to, and there are tons of companies out there that'll wanna sell you 
um, cybersecurity risk assessments all day long. Um, but we did partner with the company and help us through that. Now you can go and do that on your own as well. Um, you know, the key there is being honest with the assessment as you go through it. Um, but uh, the company that we used, which really pushed us into adopting a cybersecurity framework, um, they used the Center for Internet Security Critical Security Controls as part of our assessment. Um, so since they actually gave us a report um, back in that format, I was reading and doing some research. Um, some advice that's out there is the first thing to do is adopt a cybersecurity framework um, so that you have a baseline to um, work from. And if you have adopted a cybersecurity framework, you know, that could tie into that prior slide of the governance risk and compliance framework where you're really using those two vehicles to measure and prioritize your, your work and your activities in the cybersecurity space. So that's just another tool to get everyone on the, on the same page. Um, Another uh, component is penetration testing. We typically try to do penetration testing on an annual basis. Um, and we, for the last several years, have um, um, scoped an engagement that was a penetration test from the outside, but also a penetration test from the inside. So you're going to get different results. You're going to see different vulnerabilities um, depending on how you structure that test. But We've gotten some really good feedback and definitely closed some really huge gaps in our environment just by uh, going through a process with uh, um, an ethical hacker to um, point out weaknesses in our environment. Um, we just recently finished one and it was actually a really good test for us um, because the attacker couldn't get in. Um, now that's a positive, but that our tests have really progressed um, because certainly the first few that we we did, uh, you know, within minutes, there was one example one year where um, the pen tester put their laptop in our network. And five minutes later, I get a phone call and he says, I'm in, I have your domain admin uh, credentials. Um, not the call you want to get, but, you know, in a test scenario, it's an opportunity for you to fix that. Um, so there's, there's definitely huge value in doing that. So this year, since I'm kind of anecdotally saying we passed this test, we need to kind of scope a more advanced test um, as a next step to kind of um, make sure that uh, we are uh, keeping up on, on top of um, our practices as well. Uh, through all these assessments I have up here, you know, I, I, I call these information technology processes or ITP documents. These are really nothing more than like standard operating procedure documents. They're not organizational policy documents. Um, they're not uh, super detailed um, information, IT staff how-to documents, but they really set like a guide, guideline and framework of what we're doing in our environment. Um, we started creating these just because with um, all of these assessments and conversations, uh, usually the auditors are looking for um, similar sets of, or similar pieces of information. So things like Active Directory security standards, or what is your incident response plan, or how do you handle on-call? Um, we wrote all of that stuff down. Uh, it allows um, pretty much a controlled dialogue with the auditors of this is what um, we do. Now, if they wanna go deeper, we can show them evidence of how we handle those things. Um, but it also keeps our uh, IT team on the same page um, as to what our guidelines and expectations are um, from a process standpoint. Then the last piece on this, um, and Nathaniel uh, and Don was, was uh, hitting on cybersecurity awareness training, uh, the newsletter piece you mentioned. Uh, we work with uh, our internal marketing team, actually started a, a, an organizational newsletter, I think a year or two ago. So we try to um, get a relevant topic into that. Um, we're doing uh, taking part in cybersecurity awareness month uh, every October, using that as an opportunity to share out and um, what else, um, simulated phishing and training each year. So I'm going to try to start talking a little bit faster to stay on time here. I got a couple more slides. Uh, so um, as I put it's this fine, together, <laughs> what's that done? You're doing great, no, no rush. All right, all right. Uh, on the technical control side, I tried to make this vendor vendor neutral, but um, I will have to mention Microsoft at least a couple times. Um, 
we did uh, gain, and some of these, these aren't all the things that we're doing, obviously, but just some highlights uh, to cover. We did uh, implement multi-factor authentication for everyone. We didn't do it uh, to everyone all at once, um, but we kind of backed our way into that. Um, and there's definitely been uh, some other mechanisms that we've implemented with MFA that make it a little more user-friendly. Um, and that's why the 365 Entra is up there. And that's um, a package from Microsoft that allows you to um, implement um, what, what they call risk-based uh, conditional access that says, if you meet a certain set of criteria, like you are on an organization device and on an organization network, maybe you can bypass that MFA. Um, or if Microsoft flags your account and sees some risky behaviors in the logs, they raise your risk score, maybe they force an MFA. So that uh, Microsoft Entra package has really um, played nicely with general MFA to make it a little more user-friendly. Um, a few years ago, we actually had hardware already in place that uh, had intrusion prevention capabilities. So um, we did were able to secure funding to turn that on. Um, so that was that was a nice win. The intrusion prevention system will keep um, malware at bay further outside of your environment. Um, whereas before we had that, we were relying on um, local tools like antivirus or web filters to keep that malware out of the environment. So I think we've got a huge gain from um, turning that on in our environment. And then um, just about a year ago, and we've had various um, SIEM tools previously, which are really just logging, monitoring, and alerting tools, security, information, and event management is the acronym. Um, the tool that we have, we are able to write uh, queries and capture information um, and set up criteria for logging and alerting. Um, so one example that I can share is actually kind of tied to our penetration test. Um, usually during attacks or pen tests, a, an attacker might want to be um, quiet in the sense of their network activity so they remain undetected. Um, in this case, um, we did observe where probably 20 different staff accounts were hit our lockout policy um, during the test. And um, we really didn't know until those folks called us and said, hey, I'm locked out. I don't know what's going on. But um, we saw a theme there that there were several of those and kind of tied that back to the pen test activity. And then as an example, we thought, you know, if this were a real attack um, and these events were happening, we would want to know about it. So we created a query um, in that SIEM tool that would alert us to an unusually high number of um, lockout attempts. So that's just one example of how we use that tool um, to log and alert of events happening in the environment. Uh, Active Directory hardening, AD hardening. Um, it is, as we've learned through these pen tests over the years, crazy how um, inherently insecure Active Directory is out of the box. So Every exploit that, um, almost every exploit that we've seen through penetration testing has been through an Active Directory weakness. Um, so I'd encourage anybody that's uh, managing those systems um, to go out and search on Active Directory hardening, look for things like weak encryption or SMB signing, um, because those, those vulnerabilities have, um, like the SMB signing vulnerability was the one example that allowed a pen tester to gain access to our network in a scary uh, short amount of time. And then these last two bullets here, these are these can be free tools if, uh, if you are US-based um, through CISA, uh, which operates uh, within the Department of Homeland Security. We are taking advantage of their vulnerability scanning service, as well as their uh, information sharing service through MSISAC. So those have been nice ads um, in our environment to leverage uh, others um, that are out there um, in the public sector. Um, now, if you're not U.S. based, you know, the biggest takeaway here is um, maybe there are other resources out there for you uh, that you can tap into. So we've been um, uh, pleased with those services um, and, of course, at no cost has been helpful. And then uh, last last bit here, good AI versus bad AI. Um, you know, how do you fight good AI or bad AI? Well, you got to use uh, good AI. And um, really, my conversation here, we hit on a lot of it already. The um, uh, 
sophisticated scams, um, being able to recognize those. Um, but when you do fall uh, prey for, say, a phishing attack and you enter your credentials, uh, a few examples that we've seen recently that have been really scary have been um, since we've added some of these controls on the administrative and the technical side and we have additional logging and alerting, um, we could see in one example where someone had accessed a phishing link, entered their credentials into it, um, and then within 14 seconds, um, the attacker or bot in this case was attempting to access their account. Uh, the positive for us out of this story is um, that Microsoft Entra package that we deployed and the workflow that we created actually recognized that that, that user was now at a higher risk level. So it blocked that login. It didn't even prompt for MFA, but it blocked that login before they even got to an MFA prompt uh, in that example, just because their risk level was higher. So that's really my, my good AI versus bad AI example and, and how to fight this, because if we can see credentials leaving a network and then trying to be accessed uh, within less than 15 seconds later, um, there's no way to fight this stuff without um, some governance and orchestration. And that's what I have um, just showing on the right uh, side of the slide here is it just another framework. Um, it's a zero trust maturity model uh, that CISA publishes. And I read through this document when we were going through the process of setting up um, these risk-based uh, access controls. And it, it just gives you a generally good idea of how to maybe approach this uh, from an automated standpoint to uh, to fight these attacks. So encourage taking a taking a look at that if you have time, um, as it certainly has helped me think about uh, fighting these things in a programmatic way. And then just uh, a few takeaways, uh, communication, buy-in, make it a priority at all levels. Um, cybersecurity can be expensive, but so is fallout um, from an attack. Uh, there's so many tools out there, it's harder to navigate. So try to choose them um, wisely. MFA, I didn't talk about principle of least privilege at all, um, but that's an important component of this. You know, MFA might keep an attacker out of your environment, but, you know, think through what level of privilege um, staff uh, are given. They probably don't need a local administrator in most cases. Um, or definitely not a domain administrator. So if someone actually gets in, uh, reducing their privilege level can help uh, lateral movement or um, prevent a ransomware outbreak in an environment. Security awareness training and cybersecurity framework. And then um, just a quick plug, uh, I've got an opportunity to talk a little bit more in depth on this at ALA in San Diego uh, this year. So I will be out there. Uh, in a little bit lengthier conversation. Um, I'd love to connect with anybody or talk more on the topic if there's interest. Super, Justin. I just loaded with great stuff. Uh, the irony uh, <laughs> can't help but escape that advocating for zero trust by a most trusted institution is a kind of a <laughs> strange uh, phenomenon here. Uh, but uh, one thing I wanted to do was uh, uh, ask Bob Boker from ALA uh, to talk about the uh, FCC's uh, uh, new pronouncement on, on cybersecurity. Uh, Bob, are you there? Uh, sure, Don. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, first, my apologies. I'm suffering from my first cold of the season. But anyway, as I just put in the chat, uh, as some people, hopefully many people know, the FCC has an open notice uh, now that they put out uh, last November on possibly creating a cybersecurity pilot program within the framework of the E-rate. Now, they are proposing uh, $200 million be allocated for this over a three-year period. And as I note here from the ALA perspective, we think a one-year pilot program is enough. You know, we all realize that cybersecurity is absolutely essential. In many groups, including ALA, uh, Shelby, that most of you are familiar with, uh, COSIN, the Coalition on School Networking, have been advocating and pushing the uh, FCC on this going back at least five or six years. So we finally made some progress when they came out with this proposal to create a pilot program. So this is uh, certainly, I think there's a 99% chance this is going to happen. It's a matter of the devils and the details. 
And a couple of things that at ALA noted to the FCC in comments that we submitted, one of which, as I noted, one year is certainly sufficient. Also, we're very much concerned that we want smaller libraries to apply for this pilot program, but many smaller libraries lack networking expertise, lack the staff time really to uh, you know go through the application process. And what the FCC, to its credit, is saying, maybe that it should uh, tell USAC, who manages the E-rate program, to work with smaller libraries in particular, to do a lot of hand-holding, a lot of other uh, support to make sure that those smaller libraries can participate in the pilot program. So anyway, we're you know cautiously optimistic. Like I said, this is going to go through. It's a matter of uh, you know how much funding is in place, how many hoops that libraries and schools are going to have to jump through to go through the application process. And the timing of this, it's not going to be uh, timed in relationship to the current E-rate application process. So people should just, uh, you know, keep attuned to what's happening uh, on this issue from the FCC with the hopes, again, that something will come out later in the spring as far as actually implementing this program. That's great, Bob. And it's really a good point about uh, smaller libraries that Heather also uh, brings up uh, in the chat. At, I mean, our two guests here are IT departments of library systems, and I would venture that most small libraries are uh, totally dependent upon uh, city or county IT departments. Right. And so they have to develop their own sort of department level or almost user level strategies to deal with the, this, as well as comply with whatever the the... Uh, the, the city or county government uh, dictates for them, but it's a different approach, right? You don't have the level of control, you don't have the resources as well. So it's good news about the FCC in uh, targeting those types of libraries in particular, but let's put it to our, our guest. Uh, what do you see that, that libraries without internal IT departments can do, you know, that, that are similar to what you're recommending you do or you're able to do because you have control of uh, the, your own networks. Nathaniel. Yeah, um, we're intimately aware of that challenge. Um, you know, we are fortunate here to have a, an IT department of three, um, but we support uh, libraries in a four county area of our state, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> where they have, they, uh, Don, you mentioned county support. They, most of these libraries don't even have that. You know, they're, they're pretty much on their own. Um, to figure this stuff out. Um, we have mm -hmm. relationships with them. Our, our library district is able to provide some leadership there. We try to facilitate discussions, share best practices, articles, keep all the people in the loop. But it's very hard to approach the kind of really good approaches that Justin talked about in, at, at that scale. And, and I think, um, you know, in my opinion, the... Uh, the library world is very ripe for some sort of structure and and an effort, you know, whether it comes from state libraries or or perhaps you know a rethinking of, of how this kind of infrastructure is is managed. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't have a clear answer. It's it's a it's a growing challenge. Interesting, Justin. Any thoughts there? Um, there are. A a, a lot of resources, so like the uh, CISA resources that are out there, um, the Center for Internet Security, they have they have a lot of information. Granted, it is complex. Um, so, you know, um, at the beginning of this, I think Nathaniel hit on, you know, with the scams and information literacy, um, even on the AI talks, we're talking about AI literacy. So it, it would take time, you know, for somebody in, on this side um, that's not technical to... Um, tap into some of that and start to understand it. But, you know, even at a base level, attending some training, um, starting to understand where, like I said, um, even that piece I glossed over at the end, principle of least privileged access. Um, if you were to take, say, everybody is running with um, a full administrative account in your environment, taking that away, if, um, you know, you were to fall victim to, say, ransomware, um, that could limit the number of devices that uh, that malware could have an impact on. Um, so so that's that's um, one component. You're talking about um, E-rate and um, 
while uh, E-rate right now isn't funding uh, security technology, um, native security technology necessarily, uh, they are funding um, firewalls as part of core network equipment. Um, so like the IPS example that we had, um, all of that wasn't um, able to be reimbursed through E-rate, but it was, I believe we're at a 50% um, due to that uh, additional component that is needed to run that IPS. So it was offset and that was definitely part of our story when we went and asked for that extra funding. Um, so, you know, and then the, and then uh, um, the vulnerability scanning, you know, so even if you're not interested in or, or um, looking to say fund a, uh, a paid for um, penetration test, the uh, vulnerability scanning that could potentially be out there at no cost um, and um, uh, awareness training. So a couple things that, that you could do, but it definitely is going to be a, a resource drain for someone to even navigate uh, those components, even if they are at no cost. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's sounding more and more like a small library is, uh, has the worst of all worlds. They, they have to run uh, an open system like a home user for anybody that happens to be walking by their house. And, uh, I mean, it's just hard enough to do that at the home level, as as we've uh, talked about here, just safe end user practices, but then to also be a provider at the same time, it's really a challenge. So I, I hope this FCC move will trigger a lot of action, a lot of education. I like the idea that the, that the state agencies may provide some sort of a, a tap into infrastructure that these small systems could use. Uh, Stephen, we're, we're over our time a minute here, but if Justin and Nathaniel don't have to run off, uh, we'll continue for a couple of minutes here and let Stephen Abram uh, weigh in. Stephen, good to see you. Thanks, thanks, Don. I was uh, wanting to share what we've done in Ontario about five years ago. We pulled back and look at the big picture. So I'm on the library advisory board for Orion, which is our uh, research information network organization. And it focuses on municipalities and the public libraries, medical and hospital libraries, uh, universities at large, and uh, one more. Any, anyway, what we pulled back on is the universities set themselves up with over a million devices connected to their networks. And we created a province-wide, the equivalent to your state's, uh, chief information security officer for the entire province for all the universities. Now we're expanding that and we've been able to uh, cut back all the attacks by standardizing and leveling things. So public libraries have the split between their um, uh, administrative systems and then their public systems. We have control over the administrative systems and the staff, and we can train them and say, don't do that, slap your wrist, we're going to put something on your device. We don't have that control over the hundreds and thousands of devices that walk through our libraries. So the universities had the same thing. So we ruggedized this in the universities, and we've got the attack, not the attacks down to a dull roar, but the consequences down to a dull roar. So the chief information security officer spent several years developing the principles and the tools and then installed them at every one of the 25 universities and the 36 colleges and then the research institutes associated with them and leveled it for administrative staff versus student access versus special access like military contracts and stuff like that that have uh, different rules on them. So now we're rolling it out into the hospitals and into the municipalities. So the Toronto Public Library attack or the British Library attack that uh, have been egregious and horrible, I'm sure the two, Nathaniel and Justin, have been following it uh, because it's been so major. We're hoping that by rolling in a chief information security officer, not only fixes the largest library system in the world, but it also ends up benefiting all the small libraries 
with the fine tuning that's necessary for library use with the matrix of allowable use when you're bringing in an iPad as a student or a senior versus uh, protecting your internal systems uh, from uh, the rest of it. So I thought, I think that the starting point, the best starting point we imagined and implemented five years ago was the chief information security officer leadership position and their counsel from the best informed and trained people at every one of the universities to move it forward. And that might be a model you might want to investigate and consider for state level or national programs. Super interesting, Stephen. Thank you. And it and it fits with uh, this this notion that Nathaniel had pointed to of, a, of an infrastructure that could be created that individual libraries as members could join and benefit from centralizing uh, security uh, to a degree. So or governments could mandate it. This is too important. Yeah, well, governments yeah, need I to mandate it. <laughs> right, 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 right. I was going to I was going to mention because okay. in Pennsylvania, the, our our red is also um, you know starting to undertake those tasks. Um, you know, our research and education network, and and I think that that's that's a good uh, a good place for for this kind of thing to, to start to grow. All right, very good, uh, Justin. Any last word? Um, I mean, besides the commercial to appear at LA, ALA in San Diego, we're looking forward to that. All right, Don. Nope, I'm good. Thank you both. Nathaniel, Justin, you've just provided us a ton of useful information. The recording should be up by tomorrow, and I have a good feeling that people will want to play it again because there was just too much to take in uh, real time. So thanks again, and I want to thank everybody. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now.